Social Equity Session 2A, Presentation 2, here at PNCWA 2022. Thank you for being here. My name is Andrea Boyd. Um, I'm a Water Resources EIT with Mead and Hunt, and also a member of the Racial Social Justice Committee, which is a subcommittee of the Member Services Committee. If you're interested in learning more about Racial Social Justice Committee or the Member Services Committee, we're having our meeting right after this at from noon to one in room 102B. So come join us or come talk to anybody that you know is a part of it. And we'll definitely like to get other more people involved. Um, I'd like to introduce our present presenters, uh, Brett, Robin Brent Robinson and Brenda Gardner. Uh, Brent is a professional engineer at Murray Smith with 11 years of experience in engineering analysis and planning in both the private and public sectors. Uh, Brenda Gardner is a professional engineer formerly with Seattle Public Utilities and newly as of this week with Murray Smith. <laughs> with, with 15 years of experience in design analysis and planning, and they will be presenting getting specific on equity in a project plan and aligning a team, why common connection isn't enough. And after the presentation, you can get your uh, CEU stamp from Ms. Shelby Smith in the corner by the door. Right, take Thank you very much. And then how do we advance the slide? Is it the green button? That one? Uh, is it the green? Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. It's been a few years since I've spoken to a crowd, so I'm just gonna work on my nerves for a second, get back in the flow. Um, thank you so much for being here. It's a packed room. I actually had a dream last night that we spoke at the wrong time and no one came. So this is, this is an improvement upon that. A um, Couple of things kind of before we get moving and also a quick, um, quick uh, adjustment. It's quite common language is not enough. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, we both used to work at SBU. Um, and now we don't, we no longer work there. So it's a little bit awkward to present work that well, we don't work for the organization anymore. But that being said, we, we led the work while we were at the agency and it's work that uh, we really wanted to share. So we're just gonna fight through that. Um, I was a project manager for the project and Brenda assisted me, especially on the equity piece. And um, we're excited to be here today. Um, one thing we also wanted to acknowledge is that while this is a conversation about equity, specifically racial equity for SVU, um, you know, we're two white people leading equity work, and that's a reality in a lot of these organizations. Or, you know, you've got the staff you've got. So we want you to know that behind the scenes, we were in deep collaboration with especially the Environmental Justice and Service Equity Division at SBU, as well as our POC colleagues. Um, but we're here today to present. So Brenda, take it away. Yeah, so before we get started, um, a couple things that I want to go over are the foundational truths, and these are adaptations from the City of Seattle's Race and Social Justice Initiative, and I'm going to just talk about three. They're actually a long list of foundational truths, and the first one is um, regarding our society, that we live in a highly racialized society, and what does that mean? It means that race matters, and we know that this is true based on people's lived experiences but also based on data on outcomes of people's livelihoods, economics, housing, criminal justice, and a myriad of other things. Um, the other piece that we wanna talk about is that we're all part of the picture, that none of us asked for this, but we all have roles to play in it, that we're not responsible for the past, but we are responsible for the present and to some extent, the future. And the, the third thing is that our health and well being are interconnected and our liberation is tied. White supremacy works to disconnect us from ourselves, from each other, and from living systems around us. And anti racism is a practice to really connect with your mind, body, and heart. And I wanted to bring these things up because I want you all to come to the same space that we did, that these are our foundational truths entering into this space and through this presentation and how we implemented the work. So you ever tried to lead a complex team through something new? Was anybody ever confused about what it was you were actually trying to accomplish? Um, did team members ever disagree about how to move forward? And did you ever struggle to create consensus? Well, we did. Um, we, we led a project um, uh, that led with a racial equity lens, a planning project. And that was, this is new, right? We are on the bleeding edge of this as utilities, trying to figure this out, what it actually means to apply equity within our work. If, if anybody came to Nikki's speech before, or talk before this, there's gonna be a lot of connecting elements here. So I'm so glad that, um, that you were, that you, for your speech ahead of ours. Um, we tried to do this and we struggled. And so this talk today is about where we, 
hit stumbling blocks and what did we do to remedy that with our team, knowing that we we're all kind of coming to this from different angles. So I think before we get to the specifics of the project, it's important to kind of downscale how we got to kind of the intent of our work, which was to lead with an equity lens in um, technical planning. Um, SBU has a strategic business plan. Inside of that strategic business plan, we have a documented vision. The vision is that we will be a community-centered utility. And the definition that sits in our strategic plan is that uh, we will put people at the heart of what we do in shaping policies and services. The strategic business plan encompasses both the water line of business, the, the solid waste line of business, as well as the drainage and wastewater where we live. Um, it is an intentionally broad definition. And it is so because it's supposed to cover three different parts of the utility. And it's up to us as project managers and as program managers to downscale that vision into our program. Um, the utility has made a substantial investment of time in, in its staff uh, to, to really center, to, to define what equity is and to really create shared understanding that it is value and that we should do something about it within our organization. And so that, that investment's been done. So now the rubber's starting to hit the road. Well, let's, let's apply it in our work. And so um, we worked in the combined sewer overflow reduction program and it gave us the opportunity to think, well, let's rethink what does CSO planning look like with a racial equity lens. Um, and one of the first projects out of the gate was uh, a study in the Delridge neighborhood in Southwest Seattle, um, where we needed to do some planning to reduce CSOs a little bit more. Um, Delridge is one of the most racially diverse neighborhoods in the city. It's also one of the least white neighborhoods in the city. And so when we think about being a community centered utility and we hold in that same space, the foundational truths that Brenda went through, it kind of elevates some new questions. How could CSO planning, and I think specifically the subsequent infrastructure investment, so like the investment of money into this neighborhood better serve the communities of color in the neighborhood, often because they've been largely forgotten by city planning and ignored and really haven't done much for Delridge. Um, and how might planning change, the process of planning? How might that change if we centered communities of color? Um, how might our project objectives expand? And what might be sort of the expanded set of outcomes? How do we actually do the planning and what will the planning outcomes be? Um, so to get into the actual project itself, uh, there was a CSO, uh, we needed to define a set of CSO investments for about 20 years or so um, for Delridge. Um, we had sort of technical objectives as well as community-centered objectives that we wanted them to live in parallel and have sort of equal weight in determining what the trajectory of this project would look like. So our te technical objectives were we needed to meet state law, one CSO per year. Um, however, we were, we, the basins we were looking at were already around two or three CSOs per year. So there was, it wasn't much of an environmental benefit going so few um, overflows per year. So we also wanted to invest in stormwater solutions because all, all of the pollution in Delridge collects in a creek that's salmon bearing and has a lot of shared identity in the neighborhood around kind of the, this creek being basically backyard nature um, for a lot of communities in Delridge. And so we wanted to make sure that we actually, when we made this investment, it actually had a real measurable environmental outcome. But the community centered objectives um, that lived right alongside those were because this, the communities of color in particular in Delridge really have not been engaged by the city to drive investments. We wanted to actually do the engagement work with these underinvested communities to understand what those priorities were and have that shape the sort of the approach to reducing CSO. I mean, we're talking about many millions of dollars of investment and um, there's, there's there are multiple infrastructure approaches you can take to get to a CSO frequency outcome. Um, so we, we wanted to make sure, how, are we picking the right tools? Um, we wanted to develop the options. So when you think about technical planning for infrastructure, you'd go through options analysis, often you look for the least expensive option. We wanted that process to involve the communities of color in Delridge so that we, there was a co-creation element that we were doing this in collaboration with. Um, and then long-term in terms of delivery and long-term ownership and maintenance, um, we wanted to explore the idea of forming partnerships for multiple benefit outcomes as a part of the work so that we are not just the ones driving the show. We are doing this um, in collaboration with um, their agencies, um, community groups and nonprofits. And so things got weird. Um, <laughs> A little bit of background on the process we, we took. Um, typically in options analysis, it's real technical analysis. Where is infrastructure feasible? We broke up our planning into two separate phases into, with, with a lot of intention. Part of that was because 
we still had some you know technical work to do to understand the system a little bit better but we also wanted to have a, a pause point between two different phases to kind of say are we on the right track are we pointing in the right direction what needs to change so we broke planning up into two different phases which we creatively call phase a and phase b phase a really focused on problem definition so quantifying the size of our problem developing the sets of tools we would then use to to solve cso and kind of creating some um some tools we could use to plan in a collaborative space rather than just giving it to a team and say solve uh, developing the framework so we kind of guide some of the work especially around arts-based engagement but then actually starting to do some engagement with the community uh, we recognize the fact that um, you can't just walk into a community and say hey please work with us um, we trust us we got your best interests at heart you have to lay the foundation with the community um, before they, they will lend you your trust. And so we, we knew we needed to do that up front um, to establish our name, what we were trying to do, and to make the investment in the community through some initial engagement. We then would pause and develop a project management plan to go into the second phase, which really does look more like technical planning. So we do the co-creative planning aspects, we lay out our maps and talk about where could infrastructure go, really focus on prioritization to start to kind of point the ship in a direction um, as well as start to build the, the partnerships that we would need it for long-term design and delivery. Where we started to hit road bumps was in the engagement phase of phase A, as well as the project management plan development between the two phases. Um, things got tense inside of the, um, the consultant team. They got tense between the, team, the consultant team and the agency. Um, there was very misaligned expectations about what it was we were supposed to accomplish to achieve our vision of community-centeredness. Um, largely, and, and Brenda's going to go through how do, how do we come to that understanding. So there was infighting in the team and disagreement about how to move forward. We've, we've, we've kind of ramrodded it through to get done with phase A and decided, okay, we'll take a breather. We'll just do our project management plan. And when we got to the PMP phase, which really was very internally facing at the agency um, around how, what, is, what did we learn in phase A and what are we going to do in phase B, um, we could not agree between staff um, that were working the project, um, the uh, EDGE C division, so our Environmental Justice Service Equity Division, as well as management um, who are accountable for cost. Um, we could not align. And um, this is a story about how we unearthed that and what do we do about that. All right, how many of you just had a visceral reaction to these headphones? <laughs> I think we've all been there. You take your headphones, you wrap them up real nice, you put them in your pocket or you put them in your bag, you walk for a few minutes, you go to pull them out and nightmare. <laughs> That's basically what happened here. We thought that we were all in agreement. We thought we were headed in the right di direction, the same direction at least. And then after some check-ins, we start to see symptoms in our team meetings. There is a problem here. The meetings are tense, disagreements are happening. There are professional relationships that are being harmed. Um, individual firm deliverables aren't being consistent on strategy. SP wasn't happy with how the uh, how phase A was progressing. Um, and SP staff were actually discussing things differently amongst each other. And emotions were just generally running really high. And so we had to take a pause to figure out, okay, like we know PMs know something is going on here. This isn't right. We shouldn't be having this many disagreements. Um, and we also know that when you have these headphones, it's gonna take a lot longer to untangle this mess um, than it was to create it. So as we started to dive in to figure out what's actually happening here, where is the disconnect? What is, the, what is causing this tension? The reality that we thought we had was we're all moving towards community centeredness and we all agree on what that means. The reality that we actually had was that we're all moving towards community centeredness, this nice neat term, everyone says it's something different. You know, community centeredness means something different to the consultant, to SPU management, to SPU planning staff, to SPU uh, environmental justice staff, um, and it hasn't been defined. So um, now we're starting to see, okay, uh, well, this isn't what we expected. We all thought that we knew what community centered was. So we started this process to untangle what was happening. Um, and if we, well, so, okay, so we start this process, we do internal workshops, right? So we're figuring out, um, we need to ground ourselves in why this work is important so that we know that we're all on the same page. So we have grounding, why is this important? And then we're defining our equity principles. How are we gonna move this work forward? What are the principles that we're gonna use to embed in this project? 
And that workshop was really successful because everyone was super excited. Everyone was really passionate about embedding equity into this work. And we all agreed on the equity principles. So like, okay, well, what's the problem? I don't understand. We're all agreeing. We all know that this work is important. So then we get to the survey. So we surveyed our internal staff and we said, okay, we, we agree on what our equity principles are. How are we actually going to embed those principles into the work that we're doing? How are we gonna make it happen? And we asked our staff, the subject matter experts and our management. And this is where we started to see the root of the problem, um, the how and, we, and how we were gonna do the work. And I'm gonna talk about that in more detail. And then after that, uh, we started to see those themes and then um, develop consensus based on the things that we were seeing and then reflecting that information back to the team after we had synthesized it. So back to those survey results. I'm going to take this out of an equity context for a second. Imagine that you are planning a vacation with your family. I don't know if anyone's ever done this, but you're on a group text and your mom's like, we're going to Mexico for a week. And you're like, well, I thought we were going to go snowboarding in Vail. And your brother's like, well, actually, I just wanted to stay home and play video games. And your dad has probably never checked the group text in his life. So he doesn't even know we're going on vacation. And that's kind of what you're seeing, right? Is that everyone is agree in agreement that we're all going on vacation. That's great, except for dad. He'll figure it out later. <laughs> um, but we're all going. Everybody wants to go. Everyone sees the value in it. And now um, how do we actually execute it in a way that everyone is going to be on board? So when we started getting these survey responses in, bringing it back to equity, um, the responses were varied. There was no consensus in direction. And some of these implementation ideas were actually in direct conflict with one another. That's a huge problem. Um, so we pause, stop and consider. And this is when I call on my subject matter experts, the folks that I have good relationships with at environmental justice and service equity um, that I've worked with um, on the race and social justice change team. Um, to really lean into um, them as resources to help me figure out what is it that I'm seeing here? What are these things that are happening? Um, and they were quickly identified that we haven't defined our endpoint and gave me a tool to help adjust our approach and come to consensus. So that's this tool here. This is the community engagement continuum. And this is just one of many tools. Like there's so many different tools that you can use, but this is the one that our folks were familiar with and that helped me um, have a framework to have conversations with staff to figure out where we were on this continuum. So um, as you can see, there's anywhere from ignore at zero all the way to deferring to community at five. And I think you'll probably recognize one, um, it's informed here, what we would call informed consent, which I think is where a lot of us um, are used to projects landing is in this in informed consent. Um, and, and so I think that what's happening was everyone wanted to be in defer to, it's kind of like that cancel culture, right? If you're not in defer to, then you're not doing the work and you're canceled. Um, and there was a lot of pressure on the team to defer to, um, and we had to get real with each other and transparent. And does, it, does the community actually have capacity for us to defer to them? Do they even want to do this? Do they wanna be deferred to? Do they have the resources? Do we have the resources? Do we have structural barriers that we need to start unpacking to actually defer to community? So we use this framework um, and here's an example of how we used it. So one of the sample questions that we had in the survey was, how would you envision leading work with a racial equity analysis for Longfellow Starts Here? That was the name of the project. And so we started to take the input that folks gave us and categorize those along the spectrum to see where are we as an internal team um, on where we think, like how we think the work should be done and where does that fall on the spectrum? So you can see, and, and this is somewhat subjective, right? We decided these as a team um, on what we thought, where they, where they fit in. And you could argue, maybe this one should actually be involved, but this is where we landed on as a team. So um, for example, receiving input and circling back, we would say that's probably consult. Um, ensuring that everyone has a voice, that's an involved process. Uh, partnering with Office for Planning and Community Development, well, that's more collaboration. So it helped frame our conversation. Um, and then it became much more productive because now we actually had some terms and some words and we were using the same language to get at how are we actually gonna make this work happen on this project. So the consensus were 
as a team, we had these expectations that we need to be further along the community-centered spectrum to do good work, but that there were challenges involved in that community capacity and structural barriers. And then the outcomes are really that working with our edge C staff, that meaningful work can happen at each point along that continuum. Don't try to be defer to if you're not at defer to, if you don't have the staff, the skills, if the community doesn't have the capacity to be able to do that. Be okay with being at consult or involve or inform, and then build capacity, brainstorm ways to build capacity into your projects, into your systems and structures so that the next project or the next program, you can be further along in that continuum. So one of the ways that we would do that on this project was there was a racial equity toolkit that was done as part of phase A. Revisit that racial equity toolkit in phase B, but this time include a power analysis. Look at who in the organization has decision-making power, who um, in the consultant side, who on the community side, um, who has funding, and how can we start to look at shifting that power analysis to be more balanced, to serve community. So what should you learn from this? Number of ideas. Um, we, we learned that just having a set of terms that we all were bought into that were aligned with our overall values was not enough for us to be tactical in um, developing a project that could make good on those values. Um, if I had to make a recommendation, and, and this is, I think this is, this is beyond just equity. This is anything that's new. You're leading a team that through something that's new and, and you've done taking it on, build the capacity up front to create a lot of shared understanding around what those terms mean. Um, especially if it's coming from on the agency side, a strategic vision down to your project, define the terms. Um, we, this, we picked, that was a big stumbling block for us. Um, look for organizing frameworks that bring outside language that we all have access to and all have understanding to kind of really kind of orient and ground us. So if you came to Nikki's presentation earlier, she used a framework to help us understand different value sets, right? We understand the words in those different frameworks and it helps us understand kind of where we where we all land along the spectrum. We found a framework that worked for us that helped us map out the disparities um, in our team so that we could then have a productive conversation about how to pick some, some way to align. Um, and it wasn't until we had the framework before we could really understand that there was a lot of nuance in our value set or like and how we were stepping into the project and how we wanted to carry it forward. Um, create the forum to gracefully navigate tension and contend with misalignments as they arise. We, we assumed without discussion that because we, the team that we had formed to lead a CSO project with a racial equity lens, everyone was bought into equity that we could carry the work forward. And um, the answer was no, we needed the forum um, and we didn't have it. And so thing, as things would arise, um, we didn't have a, a way we hadn't made the investment of time to be able to navigate the team through those tensions. Um, we didn't have a form that could really help us make room for growth because this is tough work and it's inside of a rigid hierarchy of the, of the agency. Um, the consulting world largely does not have the chops yet to really kind of embed equity, I think, in, in utility planning work. And so we're all coming to this from different angles and there's a lot of learning that we need to do on the fly if we're gonna make good on this work. Um, address harm. So I'll speak for my own, for myself. Um, there was a there's a time in the project, especially in the engagement work, when as project manager, noticing that things were not aligning, parts of the team weren't working with each other very well, and the work wasn't being pushed forward. Um, I tried to make some decisions that would allow us to do something that isn't the defer to column uh, without having the language set for that. And I was, I was called racist multiple times um, in, inside of the project as the project manager, which then, I mean, I thought I was like, oh, put your big boy pants on, just fight through it. Like, this is, this is the moment, it, this is gonna happen. And it, like, it still hurts. And especially when we were all trying to point the, the direction together, um, it, it harmed my ability to then lead the team and then have the emotional capacity to help to have other people on the team also move the work forward. So as harm arises, it needs to be addressed. And that sometimes looks like pausing, that sometimes looks like you're not gonna meet your schedule, but I think it's important because you everything downstream of harm, it will be, will be sideways in some kind of way. 
Um, and then lastly, and this is something that I'm sure you've heard multiple times, but it's always worth repeating because you learn it the hard way, is lean into a slower process and with embedded iteration. Plan to course correct. We, we struggled in phase A with our consultant contract because we did the sort of the typical thing. You, you write all your different tasks for your scope and you have your budget, you get it approved, signed. And then when things went awry in the engagement phase in particular, we didn't have the mechanism besides like a huge amendment to course correct with the consultant team, which now you're now not only are you not recognizing sort of the change conditions inside which you're working, but you don't have the structure in place to pivot. And that made it really, really hard. Plan to course correct. We, when we were doing our internal work that Brenda was talking about, we were able to course correct because we didn't have a consultant contract. We were leading the work inside. And by, by having the ability to course correct, we, we were able to get to a much better place and align most parts of the agency around the direction. To me, this looks like um, having an on-call con style contract where you can write individual task orders and you can, have, you can have a larger sort of roadmap and a vision for the work, but you can dole out consultant contract work in particular in incremental chunks so that you're not beholden to all of your scope language, just what's in the next task order. Um, that's all I got. You want to add anything? Okay. Any questions? And find, mind you, that was just the tip of the iceberg and a lot of that stuff. And I know we have to kind of speak with broad terms, so I, I apologize if it feels confusing. Um, I will come with the microphone. <laughs> we are a virtual session, so we just want to make sure our virtual attendees can hear. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, Mike Falk with HDR. So, you know, as largely a room of engineers, we, we know how to address these technical challenges. That's what we're trained on. But when I look through the lens of environmental justice, I think the area where I personally struggle is looking for what are some good resources in terms of, you know, what are like the, the checklist of things, not necessarily for the community. No, 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 no. Let me, let me, let me provide context. Let me provide context. But what are the areas to focus on so you're not missing areas? Not, not a check off the box. Excuse my term there. Yeah. Because I focus on nutrients in particular in watersheds and estuaries. And you look at disadvantaged communities, all the points you spoke about. But then when I have gotten more, I guess, exposed to considerations outside of the technical nuances. Just as engineers, I feel like the toolkits of what are the areas to focus on is lacking. So I'm just kind of curious about what are some resources to consider that are out there. I'm not going to give you the answer you want. Um, I partly because I don't know. Um, I'm also an engineer by trade, and um, so what I would tell you though is that more so than what are the resources, I think that the most, at least our experience in this project was we brought together a diverse team that had engineers, landscape architects, community engagement professionals, art space professionals. Um, and we struggled to leverage each other's strengths, right? In theory, we could say, we could look to the community engagement professionals and say, what's the right approach here? And they would be able to communicate to the engineers what they think the right approach is. We all speak English no one knew what the other person was talking about. And so the work I saw for our team that was kind of a miss was that we needed to all be on the same page to understand each other's worlds a lot better so that when they're speaking, we actually know what they're talking about in terms of guiding the project. There's a lot of confusion. Like that was part of the confusion. Um, actually, there was the majority of the confusion. I don't know, do you want to add anything? And, and also I would invite Nikki to share because she's much more qualified to answer this than I am. Well, and I think that's kind of part of the answer is hire folks that are doing it because there are engineers that are really leaning into race and social justice and looking at both of those things. I'm also an engineer by trade, um, but I led the race and social justice change team as a co-lead uh, for three years at Seattle Public Utilities. So doing my own personal work and growth by training and learning um, on, you know, it was part of my work and also doing that on my own time so that I can learn how to have these conversations and how to start thinking strategically about implementing this into engineering, but hiring folks that are doing the work or coming to talks where you get to learn about how do I implement it into projects. Um, but I think, you know, like the point that Nikki made um, 
and the question that you got, pay people for their work. So really like looking at your experts and if you don't have that expertise on your team, find it somewhere else and bring them in, try to hire them or hire them as a sub consultant, whatever you have to do, go to trainings, um, invest in your team's trainings as well so that your younger staff can start thinking about this and implementing it and looking at ideas um, for how to implement this work into engineering would be my answer. I, we were lucky at Seattle Public Utilities because we do have an environmental justice and service equity division. And because we had really good relationships with those folks, we were be able to pull them into these conversations to really help guide us through those processes when we started to get stuck. They're very overworked. There's only a handful of them for the entire utility. So it's really difficult to get them um, on a project full time. But when you do hit roadblocks, you know, those expertise can, they can help you figure out how to get over those hurdles. Yeah, we have eight minutes or so left. Hi, my name is Jennifer Rogers. I'm with WSC and I am a communication strategist. I wanted to um, reference the bullet point at the end where you said cause no harm or do no, ad address harm. Um, I love that that's included in there, first of all, because people are coming with so many different perspectives and personal backgrounds and stories that they're coming to this with. And I'm wondering if you can speak to looking back on this project, how you could have created a framework to better prevent or mitigate harm and what that actually looks like in hindsight for you if, if you could have, you know, kind of created a wish pie in the sky. Yeah. I figured it'd be hard. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was asking for softballs, but here we are playing hardball. Um, I'm sorry. No, I think it's a great question because uh, this is not a technical exercise. This is this is now this is this is this is this is much larger than where should the pipe go? Um, Harm is going to come up. So if I had to look back, I think there's a couple things. You know, if you look at the consultant solicitation process, you read the scope of the RFP. You say, here's all the needs. You'll find the right consulting firms. We have a team we all work really well with each other. We're ready to rock and roll. And like, that's not always the case, right? You, you, it's maybe your, your firms have teamed, but you know, everybody's got a new job in the last two years. So people don't have the relationships across firms. Honestly, I think, um, I think that there's a couple of things that could have been done on the consultant team formation side. I think that they're, they should have spent the time to really build relationships as a team. Everyone stepped into the work, um, into the project without, like meaningful relationships such that by the time tensions arose, the trust wasn't there to navigate that as a team. So that's an investment of time. And I think that the utility should also have a hand in that, but I don't work there anymore. So I probably shouldn't say that. Um, so I think that like spend the time up front to build, to build the relationships and build the trust so that when things do happen, you, you have, you can leverage your trust to address it. I think that you need to have intentional time in the project to address things as they arise. What ended up happening, looking back, is that um, a lot of people who felt harm would bypass the project manager and come talk to me. Um, I don't know, maybe just people like to talk to, about their feelings with me, but and I like to create a safe space. Um, but what ended up happening is that the, the labor of of uh, addressing harm was sort of disproportionately put on a couple of people, which then burnt them out. Um, that needs to be a team-wide event. And I think especially with the harm here, what ended up happening is the consultant team in particular started to silo. And then there was lacking communication across the team and like whatever structures need to be put into place to ensure that the relationships are maintained. Uh, I don't. I, I don't want to be prescriptive of what that is. I think it's going to depend on the players um, for each individual project. But you have to continuously watch out for fraying relationships um, because it ends up in harm. Yeah. All right. We have five minutes. Did you? Okay. I'll go right up here, and then you up there. Hi, Santi Winter with Jacobs. Um, Who? <laughs> <laughs> Really appreciate your guys' openness and candidness and talking about this. Uh, two questions, I, I think maybe a little bit shorter. Yeah. Um, what's next for Longfellow Sharks here? 
And curious of your thoughts on how did the community perceive phase A and B, you know, from their perspective? Two short answers. Um, <laughs> when, when we left the agency, uh, I would say I'm not quite sure. Um, we left, where we ended up with the project is, I'll go back to the framework. Um, we ended up coalescing around an involved strategy because it's meaningfully better than informed consent, but it recognizes the fact that the community, Nikki addresses in hers, the community is not out there planning infrastructure. That's our jobs. Um, and they're not ready to defer, to be deferred to to plan infrastructure, nor is the agency ready to defer to community. We don't have those structures in place. So we, we, we ended up in an involved strategy and that's gonna guide PMP development by um, uh, SBU staff. The second question was, community perception of how fruitful. Yeah, I'm, I don't have a good answer for that because the engagement got, without going too far down the iceberg, the engagement did get pretty mangled. And I don't think that we achieved the outcome of building relationships with community in phase A like we wanted to because the team was so dysfunctional in what it meant to engage. Let me lay it all out today. Oh yeah, please. Yeah, so uh, for the community, um, I think one of the things that we really leaned into for the second part, like going back and looking at the project is leaning into that relationship with the Office for Planning and Community Development, because they already have relationships with community liaisons in Delridge. So we were focusing really heavily on that collaboration um, before I left. That was the process. So really um, having them work with community because they have those existing relationships already. So, and that seemed to be going um, actually pretty well. Hi, I'm Rachel with Browning Caldwell, and I'm a, another community engagement person. Full disclosure, I worked at Seattle Public Utilities and lived in Delridge for seven years, so no pressure. But no, actually, my question is about, um, well, first I wanted to say, with regard to um, the checklist and the framework, um, having these tools, I think, um, having worked with engineers for years, the importance of having something to map out is is really um, big. And I think that the the continuum that you presented is a great model that's used um, in a lot of places. And I would maybe say um, attending a conference or a training um, for the International Association for Public Participation might be something to consider because this is where these tools are developed and shared. And and people would love to see more engineers there because the people that go to these things, it's like an echo chamber of communicators. So just like this is a lot of engineers, um, getting more engineers into the conversation um, with practitioners would be really beneficial, just that mix if as budgets and schedules allow. Um, or reach out to uh, specialists. There's a lot of us out here. Um, but I'm really curious about what Seattle Public Utilities um, is doing to build capacity <laughs> right now in the context of the Longfellow Creek work um, to move maybe not all the way to the end of the continuum, but to be able to better consult with the community in the future or in the next phase. So we took, um, after we did that, uh, I wrote a, a memo about the entire process so that we could have those decision-making points documented and that we had a path forward. Um, and so we landed on that involved approach and then kind of really looking at what does that actually mean? So when we looked at those equity principles, what would an involved approach mean for each of those equity principles? And then we took that and when we developed our PMP process, we went through a flow chart and basically looked at what would an involved process actually look like with some of the existing structures that were developed as part of phase A. So there was the innovation team, which was basically like a focus group of community members from Delridge that were handpicked um, by the community engagement um, consultant and those folks are actually paid to, to come in and we would work with them um, on ideas or things um, like our planning maps. Um, how do we change this map so that it makes more sense for communities so that we can talk about um, what we're doing in this area in a way that's gonna reach more people. And some of the feedback that, like for, for a different project that I worked on, Rocks Hill Bog, a lot of the feedback that we got from community was a lot of folks in this area don't speak English it would be really great if we could just have visualizations of what stormwater ponds are doing instead of having all these words and talking about what it does. But can we can we get a graphic designer to come in and just like 
we'll explain what we do and then they can make it happen in a picture. Um, so things like that. Um, and then having decision-making points in that PMP process. So if we're gonna be using these maps as a planning tool, having the IT review those maps and then going back and doing an iterative process where we would edit those maps and then go back to the IT to say, is this what you all, this is what we heard, here's how we changed it. So that we're um, being accountable to a smaller portion of community that's uh, a little bit easier for us to work with than like a larger open house. Um, and then I also- I hate to interrupt, sorry, but yeah. we're at time. Okay. But feel free to catch up with uh, Brent and Brenda after the session, we have lunch going ahead. So I know a few more people have questions. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, 